Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the CAMP Counselor Training. Thank you all for joining us. Um, just to be clear, this is a CAMP Counselor Training for um, CAMP NOVA, our sleepaway camp, and for counselors who will be joining us at our basketball camp, Down South the Stigma. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and we're going to archive it, so anybody who's missed it will be able to view it and listen to it at a later time. Um, there will be a capability for anybody who has questions to type their questions in at the bottom right-hand corner. Um, right now, we're not going to start with the seizure first aid training. We are going to start with our Danielle's Law training. Uh, our Human Resources Coordinator, Christina Ferrone, will be conducting that presentation. Um, you, some of you may be hearing from Christina in the upcoming weeks, just um, collecting some last-minute paperwork, encouraging anybody who hasn't uh, given their fingerprint receipt to us or gotten their fingerprints done for a background check yet. Uh, that's something that will be needed. And, um, She'll give you a couple of other updates. Another update that I want to mention is that we will, um, our office has moved, and we will be accepting paperwork at a new location. It's not the Manasquan location. It's in Brick. So the address is 35 Beaver Sun Boulevard, Building 11, in Brick, New Jersey, 08723. Uh, any uh, completed paperwork can be sent to uh, either camp at that new address. Uh, for Bounce Out the Stigma camp staff, I want to also remind everybody that there's a training, an in-person training at our Persephone location on July 30th from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, we will need everybody there. If you're unable to attend, uh, please shoot us an email and let us know. But uh, that location will be at 322 Route 46. Suite 290 in Parsippany. And so now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Christina so that she can uh, talk to you about Danielle's Law. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. So we're going to start off with Danielle's Law, which um, is a very important part of the training. Um, I just want to make sure that my that my PowerPoint is working. So Danielle's law was signed by Governor McGreevy on October 26, 20, 2003, and it became effective in, on April 23, 2004. And the law requires that any staff working directly with individuals with dis developmental disabilities to call 911 in life-threatening emergencies. So it's really important that all of us, um, because we all work with people with dis developmental disabilities, um, head injury also is included, um, that we're fully aware of this law and what to do if there's a life-threatening emergency. <clears throat> so I wanted to read um, a little bit about Danielle to all of you. From um, Her mother uh, wrote a very touching piece about what happened to her and how this law is going to and has been um, keeping people safe. So Danielle Griskowski, uh, a lifelong resident of Carteret, and the inspiration for Danielle's law was born on December 6, 1969, to Diane and Doug Griskowski. Danielle was a beautiful baby girl who was welcomed into the world by a family that was excited to have their first child and first grandchild. Danielle had two younger brothers, um, and difficult came at an early age for her. Danielle was developmentally disabled, nonverbal, non-ambulatory, and was diagnosed with Rett syndrome, a neurological disorder seen primarily in females. Rett syndrome causes a delay or even a regression in development including speech, hand skills, and coordination. So Danielle needed total care and help with daily activities. But despite her disability, she led a full and active life as a member of her family and the Carteret community. In 1972, Danielle was a founder of the Carteret Specials, 
which is a unique group dedicated to enriching the lives of local children with special needs. And this group is still active today. At the age of 28, Danielle moved into a group home in nearby Edison, New Jersey, in the hope that the greater independence of adult living would benefit her in positive ways. But on November 5, 20, 2002, Danielle died tragically and needlessly at the age of 32. Although Danielle had been running an extremely high fever all night and was having difficulty breathing, no one at the facility called 911 to get her the help she most desperately needed. By the time Danielle was driven to a doctor's office the next morning, it was too late to revive her. So on May 18, 2003, uh, family, friends, and legislators, legislatures gathered together at a dedication ceremony at the library in memorial of Danielle, and a plaque hangs in her legacy as an inspiration to others. So Danielle's law is very important to all of us today and on an ongoing basis because we need to know what a life-threatening emergency is um, and you know what types of signs we need to look for so we can keep everyone safe. <clears throat> so Danielle's law um, does have penalties if somebody doesn't follow the, the policy and someone gets hurt or um, unfortunately passes away, there would be a monetary fine uh, directly to the person um, if the, the person that fails to call 911. And staff can lose their, uh, their jobs and professionals can even lose their licenses. So that's how serious the state takes this. Um, and rightfully so because if, if somebody is having a life-threatening emergency, they might not be able to um, share it like like you are, you're, you or I. So what we want to do is make sure that we know what a life-threatening emergency is, which is the occurrence or threat of a, a potentially fatal injury, um, impairment to a bodily function, and dysfunction of a bodily organ or part. So. Just moving back. So if a person is irresponsive to pain or stimuli, unconscious, unusually confused or seems to be losing consciousness, having difficulty breathing, not breathing at all, or breathing in a strange way, having a weak pulse or there's no pulse, persistent chest pain, discomfort, or pressure, which persists more than three to five minutes, or that goes away and then comes back, Bleeding from an orifice, eyes, mouth, rectum, severe bleeding. About the time on the seizure, well, allow us to know is this a medical emergency situation or is it not? So you really want to refer back to whatever your school has put in place as far as a plan? We'll refer back to the seizure action plan that the parent and or the doctor may have put in place for that particular student to decide whether or not this is a medical emergency. So with trust, it's just an easy way for somebody to remember how to help during the seizure. On the other hand, things that we should never be doing during the seizure, we should never really put any, anything into anybody's mouth. I know for a long time we were taught that, but we can break their jaw, we can chip their teeth, they can bite whatever it is we put in there and choke. So, to avoid any injuries, never put anything in the mouth during a seizure. Uh, this includes medication, food, or drinks. 
I mean, we don't want to ever hold somebody down or restrain them during the seizure. Whether complete consciousness may be lost or just partial, we want to make sure that we're not obtaining any injuries and we're not causing that person who might be in a confused state of mind to become combative. So again, to avoid injuries, never hold somebody down or restrain them during the seizure. There are times when a seizure should be considered a medical emergency. In the school system, um, it may always be considered a medical emergency. But if we're not sure some things to refer back to, uh, if we're seeing a seizure for the first time, meaning there's no prior history of epilepsy or having seizures from that student, if our tonic-clonic seizures lasting longer than five minutes or what may be typically allotted for that student, so again, refer back to the seizure action plan or the plan that your school may have put in place. If there are repeated seizures without regaining consciousness, meaning uh, the person is having more than one seizure and um, there's no baseline that person coming out of consciousness. And then a change in seizure type. So you know your student always has absent seizures and one day they have a tonic clonic seizure and that is a medical emergency. If any injury is obtained or underlying other medical condition exists, If a seizure happens in water, uh, the reason we say to call if the seizure happens in water is just because we're not sure how, how much water may have been ingested by the student as the seizure started. If normal breathing does not resume, or if it's at the request of the parents, the school system, or the school nurse. So when we're talking about partial seizures, the first one that we're speaking on is the simple partial seizure. A simple partial seizure is also called an aura, A-U-R-A, and it's a smaller seizure that usually does not alter your consciousness at all, so the person is fully aware, but it's a warning sign usually that a bigger seizure might be happening. It lasts less than a minute. However, it's a feeling of, it could be a feeling of anxiety or worry. Um, it could be a taste that that student is tasting that. We're unsure of why. Uh, there could be a smell that they're smelling and we're not sure why. It could be a noise that they're hearing and we're not hearing it. So it's very vague and it's very hard to diagnose. But um, this is why we encourage documentation for this type of seizure. 
So you're looking for any type of normal behavior or feelings that might be coming from your student. And then if you know that they have a prior uh, history of epilepsy and you're documenting all of these uneasy feelings and all these um, out of the norm activities that are happening with the student, you might be starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together and be able to make a diagnosis of a simple partial seizure. A complex partial seizure is uh, something a little bit more as it's titled complex. So it's dealing with the specific part of the brain that's having the seizure and it's going to cause our body to do repetitive movements and motions. So for example, if the hand portion of my brain wanted to have a complex partial seizure, my brain would send a mixed up message to my hand and may cause my hand to open and close on its own. And I may still be able to walk around, I may still be able to perform other tasks, but my hand is being affected because my complex partial seizure is um, sending a mixed up message to my body. This usually lasts from one to three minutes and it looks a lot like the person can be drunk or on a substance. Um, they may be walking around, picking at things, they may not be responsive and while they're not completely unconscious, their consciousness is altered so they're in a rather confused state of mind. So if you are you know, trying to direct that person, we encourage you to do it in a very calm manner. Um, we never want somebody to forcefully make somebody do something that's having a complex partial seizure because they will become combative. So if you're in the classroom and this may start happening, what we want to do is just keep the student safe. It could be as simple as shutting the classroom door and letting that student wander about and do whatever it is they're doing for those few short minutes and keeping something out of their reach such as a pair of scissors or anything that they can really harm themselves on. And again, we want to document any activity just because this is good information with any seizure for the um, school nurse to know, for the parent to know, and in this way the parent can take that information back to the student's physician and they can make an assessment as to whether or not the medication that they're taking is working or if they need to um, redirect and find another treatment option. When we're talking about seizure triggers, of course, the first that we think of are flashing lights, but others to think about when we're talking about things that can trigger a seizure are um, missed or late medication. For people with epilepsy, they need to take their epilepsy meds at the same time every day, and missed medication could be the cause of what we call a breakthrough seizure. Any type of stress or lack of sleep or missed meals or a poor diet any type of alcohol or other drug interaction, any type of illness. So the student is having the flu this week and they're taking, um, you know, amoxicillin. That can cause the student's threshold to fight off a seizure to become lowered and we might see a seizure. Um, if the student has a cough and they're taking Robitussin, the Robitussin could interact with the anti-epileptic drug and that could cause a breakthrough seizure. So we want to consult with our physician, uh, making sure that these drugs that the student might take for a simple cold might be a good fit for whatever medication that they're taking. And for those of you who may be uh, at a middle school level, any type of hormone changes and puberty can definitely affect seizure activity. So um, if you have students that are going through puberty, you may see more seizure activity than in previous years or in future years. The impact on learning and behavior, um, this is something that we want to consider because if the student is actively seizing in school, a lot of their time might be missed. So any information that they've missed during the course of a seizure should be repeated. And then of course, even if they're not seizing, the uh, medication that they're taking to control their seizures could have some side effects. It could cause them to be dizzy or have um, a tummy ache. It could cause them to you know, have some type of behavioral issue or memory loss. So we really want to be conscious of the medication that the student is taking and always provide uh, extra support. And while we are supporting the students, we want to make sure that we have everything ready to go. A copy of the action plan so that we know exactly what we're doing if a seizure were to happen in school. Of course, we always want to be calm so that the other students are not scared 
and that we know exactly what we're doing so that we can encourage the students to always have positive peer interaction. The last thing we want to do is overprotect. We want to always encourage independence, meaning we don't have to ask the student with epilepsy, are you okay? Do you need a drink? And then we want to make sure that the student is always included to um, any activity that might be going on. Of course, making sure that there are no limitations that come from a doctor. And then, of course, if we can interact with the parents, we want to have open lines of communication there just so we have the most up-to-date information always. Here are a couple of educational presentations for students. Um, so if one of your students who has epilepsy would like their peers to know that they have seizures and be able to understand a little bit better about what it is, we offer these presentations. The first one there is listed as Heads Up for Safety. This is a program that we talk more about uh, helmet safety to prevent brain injury for the younger grades. The program Thinking About Epilepsy is for grades 4 and 5, and it does talk about seizure types and uh, seizure first aid. And then Take Charge Like Mighty Mike, we invite uh, Mike Simmel, who is a professional basketball player playing with the Harlem Wizards, to come in and share his personal story uh, as being a person who lives with epilepsy and talking about the things that he might have overcome uh, throughout his years. And then Take Charge of the Facts is a presentation that's done as an assembly for high school students for them to understand uh, epilepsy and seizures and seizure first aid methods. All these presentations are free and they're done for students, but we also have presentations done for uh, school personnel, the presentation we're doing now, and then also a three-hour long school nurse presentation. All these presentations are free of charge, and if you are interested in scheduling with us, please contact the Epilepsy Foundation of New Jersey at 800-336-5843, or you can visit our website for more information, www.efnj.com. A few optional topics that we'll talk about today really quick. Um, convulsive seizure in a wheelchair, usually for students with epilepsy that have other disabilities as well, confining them to a wheelchair. The wheelchair will have padding on it to protect the person. However, um, we want to always remember that method of trust. So staying calm, turning the person to their side, turning their head to the side if they're um, strapped in. Want to remove any harmful objects out of the way and just um, using something soft under the head and always timing the seizure. Same thing, convulsive seizure on a school bus. We want to make sure that the bus is pulled over safely and um, that we go through the methods of trust, just like we spoke about. If the person is on the seat, you want to make sure the back is to the seat. And if the person falls to the floor and they're in the aisle, you may want to put yourself in between them and anything that could be harmful to them. But again, just going through the methods of trust, turning them on their side, removing the objects, keeping them safe, and avoiding the injuries while timing the seizure. Convulsive seizure in a water. Uh, students with epilepsy are allowed to swim. They're encouraged to swim with a buddy. However, we encourage a 911 call after every seizure that happens in water just to make sure that um, the person who may have taken in water is okay but we want to make sure that the student's head is above water during the seizure. When it's safe, we can gently pull them out and then again go through the methods of trust like we've been talking about. The ketogenic diet is um, a very, very specific diet. It's used as an additional treatment option, maybe in addition to medication or in lieu of medication. It's a high fat, no sugar, low carb and protein intake diet. Uh, it's very, very specific. It's dated all the way back to the Bible. Uh, we're not really sure why it works, but it works. And when it does work, it works really well. And now not everybody is a candidate for the ketogenic diet. So you want to consult with the doctor, just making sure that this would be the right fit for your student. And um, knowing that it is very specific, so um, something like a birthday party that's being held in class with cupcakes or munchkins, that student would not be able to partake in those types of activities. So it's a very, very specific diet. It's not a fad diet. It's something you have to follow very closely and for over a long period of time for it to start working. 
and you will see seizure control there. The vagus nerve stimulator, or a VNS, is um, an implantable device that's surgically implanted underneath your left collarbone. It's attached to a cord that wraps around your vagus nerve and it sits in the back of your throat and it's sending electrical pulses to your brain to level out your brain waves. And you could see there by the picture, it's a small device. It's about the size of a quarter. And um, it can be activated with a special magnet. So now while the device is programmed, depending on the seizure type and the severity of the seizures, I'm making this up, but it could be programmed at you know 30 minute intervals, meaning that for 30 minutes, the device is doing nothing and sending no signals to your brain. But then for a five minute interval, it may be sending those pulses. And then for another 30 minutes, it won't be doing anything. And again, for five minutes after that, it would be sending the pulses. So on the 30 minutes that it might not be sending any pulses to your brain, there is a special magnet that can be used to swipe over the device and let the device become activated at the time that it's not doing anything. So the, the magnet is a very strong magnet, can be kept with the student who has epilepsy, it can be kept with the school nurse or the teacher, but um, I encourage that any uh, use of the VNS and the magnet be put in writing on a seizure action plan and signed off by the parent and the nurse just so that everybody's all on the same page and how that they should be using it. So as far as the VNS goes, if you want to use the magnet to activate the device, you can swipe once. You can swipe multiple times. You can swipe left or right or up or down. It doesn't matter. But the thing that we want to be cautious not to do is to hold the magnet over the device for more than a few seconds at a time because we don't want to shut the, mag the device off by using the magnet and holding it in place for uh, longer than just a few seconds. So um, a seizure might be able to be stopped if it's already started by the VNS. And the seizure, um, if the person is having the simple partial seizure or that aura or that warning sign that a bigger seizure is happening, you may be able to swipe the magnet over the device and stop a seizure from happening before it even starts. And then finally here is diazepam or something known as diastat. And this is a rectal valium given only by a registered nurse in a public school setting. And it's a rescue medication used for very severe seizures or very prolonged seizures. Again, in a public school setting, only a registered nurse is able to administer this by law. And um, this is just used in an emergency situation. What we're going to do now is watch a video on epilepsy. And I'll take any questions after the video is finished. America in the 21st century is a picture of diversity. So too are our schools. Not only ethnic, economic, and intellectual diversity, but also physical and psychological diversity. Since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, America's schools now do a better job than ever of educating all children. It is the right thing to do, yet it is not without challenges. Do you see anything there that how do our educators learn about the variety of medical conditions before them? The Epilepsy Foundation has made this video to help you learn about seizures in school. I had a stroke in utero, which caused a brain injury. The brain injury caused my epilepsy. The next thing I know, I roll in the back of the head, and he just collapses in my arms, and he starts shaking.